Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 824. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 3rd, 2023. All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican on Script. We are just glad you could join us. I'm here in the mobile studio. We are back in Milford at a Cracker Barrel for a couple hours, parked, and uh, uh, I'm up here in the front chair because the slides are in. Everything's a little tight as we're parked in a little parking spot, and we can't just, you know, put the jacks down and put the slides out and put the satellite dish up. You, this is a, a transitional spot as we, we're heading up north from here uh, for a, a little October in, in, in Connecticut, George. How you been doing? I'm over scheduled, Kevin. Um, <laughs> I've reached the point where I don't think anymore. I just look at what's in front of me. And I thought I had a clergy conference today. So I, Susan drove me down to Orlando about two, three hours. And when I got to the conference, there was nobody there. And I looked at my schedule and sure enough, it said I was to be at the clergy conference uh, Monday night, Tuesday and Wednesday. And then I went onto the website and it's October 23rd, not the third. So, I have nothing on my schedule today, so I'm at home today doing paperwork and feeling like a total idiot. No, no, no. no. You and I have reached a certain age where time and date has to be double-checked. Mm -hmm. No no question about it. I, I woke up this morning. I thought it was Wednesday. It was not Wednesday, George. It's Tuesday. Let's move on and talk. Okay. If all goes well, this will be the shortest Anglican unscripted in the history of all 824 shows, we I, I only have how many stories here? Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five stories. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Indian corruption, obviously, it'd be another half hour. We're not going to do that. So let's start off. Uh, Garland Anderson is retiring as dean of Neshota House. He wants to return to teaching. Uh, he was a keeper. I'm I'm a little disappointed he's stepping down. Uh, he was a great dean, and he tried to to weave that uh tech acna uh seminary post uh for no show house yeah he is he's known uh, he's known by the nickname woody woody garland mm -hmm. has been dean for and has been successful in uh, keeping the Neshota house seminary both in good standing with the acna and with the episcopal church and trinity seminary uh couldn't or didn't really want to do that but Neshota house which is the anglo-catholic seminary for the ACNA and the Episcopal Church has been able to keep a foot in both camps, mostly, I think, because of the leadership and management skills of its dean, Woody Garland. Now, I don't know if he's just tired or if he wants to get back to his love teaching and uh, get out of the politics game of uh, being a seminary dean. Yeah. But, but uh, as you said, Kevin, this is, uh, we may see some transition. Will the next dean be able to uh, thread the needle the way Woody Garland has been able to and keep both sides uh, content or will one side turn against it and uh, we'll see uh, Neshota House uh, marginalized by one group or the other. It's interesting because you know there's certainly lots of seminaries remaining here uh, on the shores of America. You know we have Neshota House, Trinity, um, VTS, you, you can name a lot of them. Uh, that serve a wide range of students. Well, the the uh, Central Florida, which is predominantly an evangelical diocese, mm -hmm. uh, right now, in the past, it would send its seminarians to Swanee, Virginia, all over the country. Today, it either sends them to Neshota House, mm -hmm. or it has them train uh, locally at a Presbyterian Reform Seminary in Orlando. Um, in other words, the, the old model of three years of residential training um, is fading away because some ordinands are getting older. They can't really uproot their family. Yeah. So those who can be moved go to Neshota House, while those who've got families and work lives, they commute to uh, a local uh, non-denominational seminary. Um, that's one of the reasons why so many of the you know, general seminaries have been failing and... Um, Episcopal Divinity School and uh, Seabury Western, you know, we've had so many closures. 
uh, Church Divinity School of the Pacific is the next to is closed and to move into a old away from the old model. The Shota House has been successful because it offered not only an academic education, but it offered a uh, formation, priestly formation, because of its uh, unique ethos. Um, and I think that will be greatly missed. Yeah. If it does, because there is no other place for Anglo, you know, where would Central Florida send its seminarians uh, without Neshota House? A few years ago, there was a big blow up because the former Bishop uh, Greg Brewer, who had taught at Trinity Seminary, got into a uh, pissing contest with uh, Bob Duncan and the trustees at Trinity Seminary over uh, uh, baptism of a child of two partnered gays at the cathedral, where the dean said no, and the bishop said yes, and it blew up, and so he was invited not to be a trustee anymore, and so we stopped sending people to Trinity. And I think Central Florida was the last Episcopal seminary that sent their people up there. Uh, maybe with a new bishop, new times, things might change. Yeah, well, to see, but, it's, a, it's one of those interesting dynamics, you know, the seminaries in America and having to weld this, weave through this thing called tech and acne. Uh, you know, we've discussed over the last couple of weeks how uh, tech is continuing to lose membership and uh, sm be smaller, and how the ACNA is slowly, not dramatically growing, but slowly increasing its numbers. Uh, you know, not enough to support 10 seminaries, that's for sure. But, uh, but the also, one of the things, you know, some of the stories we've had about the ACNA uh, in recent months about uh, people who have left to join the Episcopal Church, for instance. A great deal of that comes down to the fact that they've not been properly formed as clergy. Right. Yes. They've not really been well trained. They, mm -hmm. you know, they sort of came in sideways to the uh, Anglican Church in North America and really didn't know what they believed or understood what they believed. And therefore, when the next wave came along, they were carried away with it without having had that base formation. And see, that's that's the that's the thing about Neshota House, that what it was able, has been able to provide for people is a solid Orthodox foundation. Uh, years ago, believe it or not, uh, 30 years ago, Yale provided that solid sort of formation. You could have as solid an Orthodox seminary education as you could find anywhere at Yale Divinity School, where I went. Decades today, ago, decades ago. De today, <laughs> today that's not the case. <laughs> no. And in many seminaries, that's no longer the case. Most yeah. seminaries, I would say, the Episcopal Church. Yeah, VTS used to be a solid place. Uh, you know, General used to be a great place. I mean, oh well. Yeah, if the if the church is going to change, the seminary seems to uh, be the place that started the change. All right, let's move on to our next story. The Church of England gets slighted by the government. They don't want to hear Justin Welby talking no more. That's weird. Suella Braverman is the Home Secretary in the British government. She's mm -hmm. the one who has direct responsibility for the immigration policy. Well, as uh, people have been following the news knows, Britain is going through an immigration crisis, not as bad as we have in the United States, but pretty bad nonetheless for a much smaller country, where these boatloads of military-aged men, there are hardly any women or children in these groups, are crossing the British Channel. The French are dumping them on Britain and they're being put up in uh, expensive hotels, and they're being the same scenario you have here in the United States, where an immigrant, an, uh, an illegal immigrant, is uh, treated better than a poor native by the government. Well, the British government, uh, the, the government in Britain wanted to basically have a policy of sending these people to Rwanda to be basically sorted out there to separate those who were truly refugees and who are in danger of their lives from authoritarian governments from those who are looking for a better job or a better life or want to hook into the British welfare system. Well, the British government has been on the left on this issue, saying, oh no, how cruel and terrible to send people to Rwanda. Friends, Kigali is a cleaner, nicer city than London is, if you really or want Paris. to Or Paris. <laughs> yeah. It's a nice place, okay? Yeah. There's no yeah. trash in the streets. There's no, no homeless people. That being said, so the British government has told the uh, Church of England bishops and Justin Welby in particular, because Welby said, oh, I'd like a meeting with the Home Secretary to discuss our 
considered views on what the government needs to do about immigration. And the government says, screw you, pal. We don't need to hear from you anymore. Uh, Justin Welby has by himself just about worn out his Church of England's welcome with the British government and the establishment. Whether it's conservatives or liberals, they just don't want to hear what the bishops have to say anymore. If they're liberals, it's because they're already saying it. They don't need to have it repeated to them. And if they're conservatives, it's because they know that the Welby and company will repeat the left liberal line. I think there was only one bishop who was publicly against, uh, who was publicly for Brexit. And everybody else was against Brexit. And of course, the majority of Britons were for Brexit. The bishops are totally out of touch with the people in the pews on politics as well as religion and faith and all this stuff. <laughs> well, it's, and that's true. Now, they have another synod coming up, and they dis discuss the living life and faith uh, document, policy, life change to the church. I don't think they have the votes, and I'm seeing some uh, little traffic on Twitter saying it's, it's time to shelve it. You don't have the votes. We can't just keep kicking the can down the road on something that would fundamentally te uh, change the teaching of the church uh, with which there's no way back. You can't you can't walk back from that. We, we've only seen one church walk back from such horrible teaching, George. The what we're hearing is that the legal challenges that have been raised by uh, by commentators and his name just went out of my head. I see his face in front of me. We're basically are saying that look, you cannot by the bishop's fiat, by the bishop saying we're going to do this, do this. There is a legal process that must be followed mm -hmm. that requires votes and synod, and the bishops cannot just pretend this is a pastoral solution that doesn't affect doctrine. That's nonsense. Now, the bishops have all along said, oh, yes, we can do it because it doesn't affect doctrine. We're not changing anything. We're just changing our practice. Well, that's been pretty much uh, put to rest as a, as a canard, as a, as, uh, as a, a lie. And if they do go ahead with that, they'll wind up in court and they will probably lose because they cannot do this. And if they go the synod route, they do not have the votes to pass it. So what's happened? Well, November is when they're supposed to pre present the grand plan, how we're going to uh, permit all this to happen and have protections for conservatives. Nothing's been settled, nothing's been done. The talking shops that have been set up to discuss this, the way the organizers have set them up is that no discussion of, say, a third province for conservatives who do not want to be part of this, that's not even on the agenda, that's not allowed. It's only how can we basically continue to talk you people into this until you're so exhausted you throw up your hands and either walk away or give in. Well, the conservatives aren't giving in. So it looks like the November deadline for a grand solution is going to be missed once missed, like the July deadline, and it'll be kicked down the road once again. We're uh, David Porter uh, was uh, the, uh, uh, an assistant to Justin Welby for many years, and Porter had gave an interview with Colin Coward a few years ago, five six years ago where he said that uh, Welby is willing to lose 20% of the Church of England, 10% on either end of the spectrum, so as to keep the church together. So that the true believers in the gay cause who said, we want gay marriage, we want it now, we want full recognition. And the traditionalists who say, no, we can't, we can't stomach this, and we'll, we, we cannot have this. Welby is willing to lose both ends. So as long as he keeps the 80% in the middle, the middle muddle. That was six, seven years ago. And we actually see this coming to pass. This is the uh, solution Welby seems to have uh, chosen to get rid of the zealots, if you will, and keep the, uh, the Christmas and Easter Christians. Uh, yeah, and to keep the, the church on its progressive course. Um, and making Anglican Inc. and Anglican Scripted famous. Uh, you know, he, he's given us a career by uh, changing the, the, mother ch the mothership uh, around. It, it's sad to watch this. However, yeah, go ahead. Well, I think the, uh, though, who really cares what the Archbishop of Canterbury has to say about immigration? 
But if it's reached that point where there's no longer the need for people to pretend that Justin Welby has something important to say, that has a tremendous impact on this living, love, and faith progress sure. process. Because if the gov basically Welby has worn out his welcome and he's not going to be able to pull this off, the, the facade, the institutions are not strong enough uh, for him to continue uh, this path. I don't know. Uh, he seems to have favor with a certain pope. Uh, they got together this week, uh, had a little chit chat, and then uh, Justin Welby went off to uh, do some uh, province touring. And that's what I support. If Justin's on a plane going and uh, supporting uh, provinces and trying to, to bring peace to Sudan, whatever, I, I, I completely support that. Uh, that's the role of an Archbishop of Canterbury, in my opinion. Um, but let, let's transition a little bit here and talk about uh, Pope Francis. We have some leaked Q and A answers. And don't you want to? Don't you want to talk about uh, Justin was in in Baku and in Tiflis and I telling know, them yeah. not telling the <laughs> Azerbaijanis not to be mean to the Armenians and uh, we'll see if it works. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I well, mean, let's go back to Rome. Okay. Yeah, let's go back to Rome. Uh, Pope Francis uh, did some Q and As over the last couple months and. Uh, the first Q and A, he answered a bunch of questions, but nobody could really figure out what the answers were, you know. Uh, and they were looking for yes, no answers. Somebody has leaked these questions, George, and answers, and I think we need to go through them because this changes, if dogma is used, the future of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, this is. Uh five cardinals mm -hmm. in Jul on July 10th submitted five questions to the Pope in the form of a dubia or a question and this is a formal process where they want mm -hmm. clarification on a point of doctrine or discipline from the Holy Father and these were Cardinals Burke, Brandmuller, Sandoval, Sarah and Zen. Uh, okay, now conser conser but conservative R Roman Catholics right? Yes, they're on yes. the conservative side, yeah. American, a German from Hong Kong and mm -hmm. uh, Africa. And these five questions were written on, and on July 11th, Francis answered these questions. This was not made public. The questions that Francis answered, traditional response would be yes, no, so that it's quite clear. Francis did not answer in uh, clear yes or no terms. So in August, the five cardinals submitted the questions again. They reformulated them, said so that there would be a clear yes or no answer. Francis has not answered those questions. So this past week, because the Synod on the Family is forthcoming, where uh, representatives of the church from around the world are gathering to discuss these issues, uh, the Card uh, Cardinal Burke, uh, Raymond Burke, published on his website the questions and Francis's answers. So it's all out there. And what was said is causing shockwaves in the Catholic world. Um, the two real issues that are of uh, consequence uh, to the wider Anglican world, wider Christian world. The first is that Francis has said no to women priests at this time. Perhaps yes to deacons, but no to women priests. But, but the second, so that uh, has been being, that issue has been pushed by uh, the German church and uh, elements of the Brazilian church and other parts of the world, as has the issue of married uh, clergy, whether you can have that in places where they don't have enough celibate priests and they want to raise up local priests who are, have to be married to be ministers. That issue is basically Francis said, no to women, we'll see what we can do about the others. The major issue is Francis has indicated an openness to the blessing of same-sex unions. Now, what he said was that marriage is a unique institution ordained by God, and it is between one man and one woman, and we're not going to change that. But we are, because of pastoral necessity, going to be able to bless the relationships between two people of the same sex in certain circumstances. We're not changing our doctrine but we are changing our pastoral practices. 
And so this has caused heart failure among, well, if you were Cardinal Burke and you got this, or you're yeah. Cardinal Sarah, would you, you have release heart it? Failure. Yeah, and, and that's why it took so long to release it. Yeah. Because it basically trying to say, Francis, think about what you're doing. Yeah. Because you're now saying the church is able to bless what it had formerly called sin, non, uh, you know, relationships outside of marriage. It's still a sin. On policy and doctrine and theology throughout the Roman Catholic teaching, it remains a sin. But we can still bless it, is what Francis is saying. And this opens up other questions. Well, why can't we then bless uh, he uh, heterosexual partnerships, people who don't want to get married but live mm -hmm. together, yeah. um, which is probably more of an issue, at least here in Florida, where you have old people who live together yeah. because of it's an issue. taxes and Social Security. <laughs> yeah. uh, why can't we bless those partnerships, but we can now bless same-sex partnerships? Mm -hmm. Oh, Francis did have a little uh, proviso. He told the Germans to knock it off because the German synod, and the Germans and the Austrians want to go ahead and do this anyway without waiting for the rest of the Catholic Church. And Francis is saying, we're going to move together on this, Germans, and but we're moving in your direction. So no group may unilaterally do this until the whole church is uh, on board. And Francis is the one who determines if the whole church is on board. And where he wants to take it is blessing same-sex relations. Oh, if I were the ACNA uh, trying to have a open ec ecumenical relationship with the Roman Catholic Church, where do we go now? I mean, well, uh, now, now they're they're looking. This is this is the Episcopal Church in the seventies. This is the uh, Church of England in the nineties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, there's no way back once you take this step mm -hmm. when you start blessing sin well also on the women's issue there's no way back once you have women deacons not deaconesses but women uh, deacons. Yeah, yeah i mean once you start down that road because there's no real difference in doctrine or theology between a deacon and a priest and a bit yes they had different functions and roles but once you accept the one here there's no reason logically that you can't accept it there given your your arguments it's the same with the uh, gay blessings issue. Uh, this will uh, not stop here. It will progress, and you'll see it keep pushing, pushing, pushing. Now, what is this going to mean uh, for, for in ec ecumenical relations? That's why Francis and Welby are such pally pals, because this is what Welby wants. Mm -hmm. You know, if Francis does this, this takes a load of grief off of Justin Welby's shoulders, because he's now got the, all the cover he needs to do exactly what he wants, uh, hold the church together, and at the same time have gay blessings, and not have the threat that people are going to leave and join the Catholic Church. Uh, as No, but would this not divide the Roman Catholic Church? Is this, you know, not something, if it divided the Anglican Church, it divided the Lutheran Church, it divided the Methodist, can it, would it not also divide the Roman Catholics? Yes, it has that strong potential. Mm -hmm. It's less likely, though, I believe, because of the uh, inherent uh, independent streak within the Protestant and Anglican churches and the Orthodox churches because the unitary structure of the Catholic Church, this is a tremendous step. So it wouldn't so much be a ACNA text type split, Episcopal Church, Anglican Church split, as it might be a Pope and an anti-Pope, where uh, we have two groups calling themselves Catholic, but one anathemizing the other, saying that Pope is not the real Pope, this is the real Pope. I think that's more likely, <laughs> These are extraordinary things I'm saying, and I have no, no they idea are. what's going to happen. But <laughs> well, we, I mean, I don't know if there's real estate uh, for rent for cheap in Avignon in France to set up a second papacy. I don't know. But but, uh, but look what's happened in the Episcopal Church. In the 70s, this was a suggestion, and then they started, in a pastoral sense, blessing same-sex. Uh, we didn't have weddings back then. It was unions and stuff like that. Uh, and then... We are now to the point where you cannot refuse to participate or have one in your diocese. Mm -hmm. 
If, mm. you know, if, the, if somebody in your diocese wants to have a same-sex same sex wedding, it's going to happen. Um, maybe one diocese or two don't have to, to meet. They're the exception. But that can also happen in the Roman Catholic Church, where now it's a suggestion, it's a pastoral mandate, and then we move on to it's uh, part of the doctrine. And thirdly, uh, Cardinal Burke, you know, I'm sorry you don't want this to happen in your geographic location, but it's going to happen in your cathedral, and there's nothing you can do about it. The the issue that I think it would, should be doubly concerning is for a Catholic traditionalist is that right now, let's see, the Archbishop of Berlin has announced that he will not discipline uh, clergy who perform same-sex blessings. And that's what happened in the Episcopal Church. It started when uh, the, the, yeah, the that's, discipline... Is that Francis? Say hi. No. <laughs> no. Oh, it, it's actually my daughter. She wants me to buy her a car, and so I think I'll put it on... I, I'm not here. I think I, I'm at a clergy conference. Can't talk. Yes, we can't talk. Uh, but the, uh, the 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 lead the leadership in many places will facilitate this move by not disciplining the activists. Mm -hmm. We have had stories over the past two or three years in Austria and Germany, and I believe Switzerland, of Roman Catholic Church the clergy solemnizing gay weddings or blessing same-sex unions and the bishops don't punish the clergy for doing this they say oh you're a bad boy never do it again wink wink nod nod so up until now in this past month last month the Archbishop of Berlin has said if clergy do this I will not discipline them. that's what happened in the Episcopal Church mm -hmm. gay blessings were forbidden except in Massachusetts and Newark and other places where the bishop said, well, if you do it, I'm not going to do anything about it. When it, it it's almost akin to, uh, you know, New York City, it's against the law to uh, rob st and steal, but uh, we're not going to do anything about it. So what do you get in response? More criminality. Yeah, chaos. Just as the people of San Francisco. Oh, jeez, uh, yeah. No, the, the streets are run amok with chaos because we won't enforce our law. We do enforce our laws, we just have no cash bail. You know, if you show up for your, your hearing, you're a fool. And so. Los Angeles, that's what they have in New York City, and now Los Angeles is going to introduce that, uh, I think, this, this month. Yeah. So that unless you actually murder somebody, there's no, no short-term jail time. It, and it's just extraordinary. But well, it... What does a what does a traditionalist do in these uh, circumstances? Yeah, well, I would hate to be a person who recently joined the Roman Catholic Church for looking for a better path, you know, uh, or a, a more pure church. Uh, it does not seem to be uh, uh, the the purity that's been promised. But they're tackling two issues at once, you know, not just tackling uh, the blessing of. Uh, uh, gay marriages are tackling women and clergy as well and well, that's that's those, a double whammy those who uh have those who, you know people we know that have joined the catholic church will respond to that question well th there is going to be one last battle and i'd rather be fighting on this battlefield with allies in the traditionalist wing of the catholic church than uh, the allies in the anglican church because mm -hmm. they haven't been particularly faithful allies. I, I, I think there's truth to that, yes. <laughs> and that we've seen in the Church of England, for instance, uh, when uh, the uh, women's clergy came up and the Anglo-Catholics and Evangelicals were uh, against it, the Evangelicals folded. Now we've got the gay side, gay issues coming up, and the Anglo-Catholics and Evangelicals against it, and the Anglo-Catholics are folding on the gay side. So that you cannot... Uh, rely upon your allies in the Anglican world because they'll make separate deals or carve outs and what's good for me locally. I think if you are a true believer and you want to fight this fight, the Catholic Church may be a better, this is the last stand, if you will, in the West. Sure. And if it's, if the battle is lost to the Catholic Church, uh, our, our, the answer is an orthodoxy because as we've seen, the Orthodox world is at war with itself, uh, the Russians versus the world and this and that. So it's hardly a uh, 
and they're, they've not been able to rise above their ethno-centric uh, uh, worldviews. And I say this with all humility, but there's a lot of hubris in the Orthodox uh, Church. Um, well, Kevin, since you since I can't grow a beard, <laughs> yeah. not, I'm not going to be Orthodox. <laughs> no. But th the point is, we really don't have uh, any third options, if you will. Huh. Of, and if uh, that falls, um, I we've been talking for years of uh, sort of a grand alliance of conservative evangelicals, Catholics, and it's actually happened on a political level in the United States, mm -hmm. where once upon a time, evangelicals just looked down their nose at Catholics, and Catholics looked down their nose at evangelicals, and we wouldn't have anything to do with either side. Those days are long past, and I think we will if we see this collapse from the center in the Catholic Church, we're going to see a new formation arise. Um, what it will look like, I don't know. Yeah, it, but it, it is strange to think of it. You, know, you think of, you know, Middletown America in the 1950s and 60s. The only dividing thing in a town was the church. And uh, whether you're and the, one yeah. other thing, Kevin Ford and Chrysler on Ford and Chrysler cars, yes, <laughs> before the invasion from Japan, you know, and so you, you were Lutheran or you were Roman Catholic, some had Baptist and, and a bigger town had a Methodist church. And so those were all of the dividing forces. I remember growing up in, in Verona, uh, you know, you didn't hang out after school with the Roman Catholic kids uh, because they went to their catechism or the, the Lutheran kids believe something different. You know, and it was it was kind of strange. All that's gone. There's now a, a unity among d denominations uh, and the unity has been with the conservative denominations trying to stick together, mm -hmm. which is good. We we have, uh, you know, when I was a child, Boy Scouts were denominationally organized. We had yeah. Catholic Scouts, Presbyterian Scouts, Episcopal Scouts. Now in our community, we have one Boy Scout troop, and they come from everywhere. Um, those Now, on one hand, that's sad because there are fewer Boy Scouts, and that, of course, raises, raises the whole problem of the, Scout, of the collapse of the Boy Scouts of America. But there is the potential for good to arise out of this difficult situation. I'm sure the Apostle Paul would have a letter he could send to the Roman Catholic Church. Letter to Rome, you know. <laughs> Gee, letter to the Vatican. All right, George, let's move on. Do I have any other stories we need to talk about? And you said, Kevin, I read in the news this week that the Hong Kong Cathedral was forced to display the Chinese flag during its service. Not so much forced mm -hmm. as the, the, the Hong Kong Anglican Church is in a difficult spot. They have some CCP sympathizers among the ranks of the clergy, including the former provincial secretary, yeah. Peter Kuhn, yeah. who is a member of the provincial assembly. Uh, assembly. He's a politician and a priest. Then you have some who are very strongly opposed to the Communist Party. And then you have the vast majority of clergy who just don't want to get don't want to get their head above the trench line because of the fire coming in from the national from the from Peking. Chinese, yeah. And we had this past Sunday, uh, for the first time ever, the uh, red banner of the Communist Party was displayed next to the pulpit at the cathedral in Hong Kong. And this divided the congregation. Some people thought, yay, isn't this wonderful? We're now truly one China. And for other people saying, oh, this is horrible because, you know, this is a violation of what we were promised when Hong Kong left the control of the British and moved to, to control the Chinese. Well, the invasion's complete. But here in America, uh, the Episcopal Church I went to in Watertown, Connecticut. On the left was displayed the Episcopal Church. On the right was displayed the United States flag. No, yeah. and nobody had any qualms about it. No, no, it, it's just. And I think in the cathedral in the past they had the British flag. Mm -hmm. And in my church uh, right now, as you say, I've got the American flag on one side and Episcopal flag on the other side in the back. Um, the issue is China. 
yes. with its aggressively anti-Christian dogma of uh, shutting down churches or uh, on mainland China, um, priests now have to be registered. Their sermons are recorded. If they speak out of turn, the, they can, well, they will incur the wrath of the uh, police because they're there's a recent story in China about a, a Chinese Catholic seminarian who has just been jailed for fraud. And the reason why is that he refused to join the Patriotic Catholic Church, which is the the pro- The official King, church. The yeah. official Catholic Church. He wanted to remain fully in communion with Rome. And in the past, they sort of would, okay, yeah, but, you know, realize you're on the outs with us. Now, when you do that, you're going to go to jail for fraud because you cannot call yourself a minister because you're not recognized by the uh, state. So things are, it's a difficult situation. Plus the fact that China is going, starting an economic implosion. And oh, when these geez. things happen, when these, when, you know, stability is the, is the guiding principle of Chinese government. They just want things to be quiet and peaceful. And we are going to see China pass into a period of unrest. And one of the objects of the government crackdown will be the religious because they'll blame, be blamed for fomenting unrest. Interesting. With this uh, coming economic collapse, they may not have the, the, the pull or strings to keep Hong Kong in check. They'll be doing so much in their own country trying to keep things in check because Hong Kong is not going to go through starvation. Hong Kong's not going to go through the uh, complete collapse that China will. Um, China has overdeveloped the real estate. China uh, is having national disasters and flooding like never before. China's in big trouble right now. So. I saw a uh, saw a news article. I think it was on Bloomberg News. In other words, a mainstream news article, meaning it was approved by the Chinese. <laughs> yes, because uh, <laughs> Bloomberg has Chinese investors. Big time, um, yeah. The a housing retired housing minister was quoted as saying that there are a billion vacant housing units in China. In other billion, words, yeah, a billion. In other words, they, basically enough empty houses have been built and apartments that almost every person in China can have two places to live. And if these things are rotting and crumbling, but all that money invested is now is essentially wasted and is never going to get recouped. Yeah, but there's also the people who were farmers for uh, centuries who moved to the cities to spend their money on these little condos and have lost all their investment. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they bought these uh, uh, properties that were just booming and the thing to do uh, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, and that money's all evaporated. Not not just the farmers at the rising middle class in China. You yeah. don't trust the stock market. You trust real estate. You can see it. You can touch it. You can see it. Mm -hmm. And now that apartment, you spend half a million uh, dollars yeah. on euros, yeah, yeah. yuan. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's now worth nothing because of such oversupply. Mm. All right, let's go check the story list. I think that's it. We're not doing any Indian corruption. Wait, this uh, we're at thirty-eight yeah. minutes. Yeah, uh, we should probably give a, uh, a, pr a prayer request for Michael Curry. Yes, absolutely. Uh. He had a tumor removed from his adrenal gland um, and. It was not cancerous, but they wanted to go and do a lapis, lapis, lapis. They wanted to do it with a little keyhole surgery. Yeah, yes, laparoscopic. But it, it was bigger than that, and so they had to open him up. So he is uh, going to be recuperating uh, for some time in hospital. It was a major surgery, but it wasn't cancerous, and he should, he should do well if there are no complications. Yeah, it's a survival surgery, and um, other than age, he should do just fine. You know. And I say that as people who keep forgetting our calendars, so no big deal. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 824 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>